What's going on smart people? Today's video is all about differential equations and more specifically why do they seem to pop up everywhere in physics? One thing that you're often told and I've, I'm actually guilty of saying myself is that differential equations help relate something with how that something changes. Which is true but it's like what are you supposed to do with that information? How does that help you? So today I'd like to offer a bit of an alternate explanation as to why they're so useful and though we're going to be solving a couple you don't actually need a course in differential equations to understand what I'll be doing. The only prerequisites I have is that you need to know how to take basic derivatives and basic integrals by using things like u substitution. But the way that I plan on doing this is we're going to start with the special case of something and we're going to rephrase it in terms of the solution to a differential equation and then we're going to sort of work our way backwards and show that in expressing it as a differential equation we have a means of describing a wider range of things. We can describe more than just that special case now. And then at the end of the video we're going to connect the dots to what we do in the beginning to actual physics. If you're given certain assumptions or certain initial conditions, how your differential equation can reduce to some special case or to describing some special case. But for now, let's pretend that we have some equation that models some type of projectile motion problem. Like you were able to input some kind of angle above the x-axis and some initial velocity, and you were able to fit the data and it gave you some parabola that told you if you were to give me some x from the origin, it can tell you how far above the x-axis it is, what its height will be. Interrupting this program real quick, this little introductory portion that I'm about to get into took a bit longer than I thought it would, and I don't want to waste your time, so if you feel completely comfortable with fundamental differential equations, like how initial conditions help go from general solutions to more specific cases, then you might want to skip to this part of the video. Alright, back to this next clip. Uh, so let's say, since this is clearly going to be a parabolic problem, let's say that we have y equal to minus x minus 3 squared plus 2. So we're displacing it from the x-axis or from the origin by 3 and shifting it up by 2. It's going to look something like this. Here's 3, here's 2. Right, just your classical projectile motion problem. And this is a very specific case, right? If you were fitting the data, you'd have to input these angles and stuff. But our goal today is to be able to take these specific cases and generalize them. Uh, and the way that we're going to end up doing this is by turning this into a differential equation which reduces back to this if we give it some assumptions, if we give it some initial conditions. So if we want to turn this into a differential equation, let's take the derivative with respect to x on both sides, which tells us that y prime is equal to minus 2 x minus 3. Now technically this is a differential equation, but I want to express this term here uh, in terms of y. Alright, and like I said earlier, I'm assuming you all know how to take derivatives, so I'm assuming you know chain rule to get from here to here. But now I want to write this term in terms of y. So let's go ahead and subtract this equation. Let's subtract 2 from this equation. So we got y minus 2 is equal to minus x minus 3 squared. Let's multiply both sides by minus 1. So we get minus y plus 2 is equal to x minus 3 squared. Let's go ahead and take the square root of both sides and let's go ahead and take the positive solution because you know this is going to give us two, two of these solutions uh, which is equal to x minus 3 and multiply both sides by 2 so we get actually by minus 2 so minus 2 root minus y plus 2 is equal to x minus 3. Oops, equal to minus 2x minus 3. Great, so now we have this term written in terms of y. So we're going to substitute this in to make it look like a, like a full differential equation. So now we have y prime is equal to minus 2 square root of minus y plus 2. Great. And I know I'm going to be needing some space, so I'm going to give you a warning now that I'm going to be erasing this. This is just the algebra, writing it in terms of here. Okay, so I'm going to erase this. And that should be the last thing that I erase before we're done. Okay, so now let's go ahead. We have our differential equation. Now we want to work our way backwards a little bit. Now let's solve this differential equation and see what we get. So it might be a bit more clear if we write this as dy dx is equal to minus 2 root minus y plus 2. Okay, 
and let's multiply both sides by dx. So dy is equal to minus 2 root minus y plus 2 dx. And now we're just separating variables. So we're going to divide both sides by the square root term. So we get uh, dy over the square root of minus y plus 2 is equal to minus 2 dx. So all I did here was I divided this over, and this minus 2 is still attached to this dx. And now all we're going to do is we're going to integrate these, these two equations. So we're integrating this with respect to y, we're integrating this with respect to x. This is also why I said you should know uh, a little bit of use substitution. So here we have this thing in the square root that we need to integrate. And if we do a little u substitution, we let u equal minus y plus 2, then du is equal to minus dy, which tells you that dy is equal to minus du. It says any time we see a dy, we put in minus du. Okay, so let's go ahead and substitute this in. So we get an integral of minus du over, well this is just the square root of u, is equal to the integral of minus 2 dx, okay? And this is just integral of u to the minus 1 half du, which is equal to minus 2 dx. Okay, and this is just going to give us a 2 times, actually uh, one thing that is missing is this minus sign here when we wrote this up top. So this is actually has a minus sign tacked on, right, because it's minus this. So it's minus u to the minus one half. And then when we do the integral, remember that the integral of x to the n is equal to 1 over n plus 1, x to the n plus 1, assuming you're innovating with respect to x. So this is equal to minus 2u to the 1 half, which is equal to integrating this side, we get a minus 2x plus c. Really, since we're not placing bounds on either of these, there's, uh, there's going to be a plus c on both of these sides. But since you have a constant on one side, a constant on the other side, I'm just combining those into another constant, which I'm calling c. Okay? And now we're ready to substitute stuff back in. We might as well get this negative 2 over real quick. So this becomes uh, square root of u is equal to x uh, minus, let's call this c1, because we're dividing by minus 2, where, where c1 is equal to uh, c over minus 2. So I'm just dividing this negative 2 over. I don't feel like writing that, so I'm just calling it c1. Since I already went through the trouble of writing out a specific c. I don't want to call it the same c. Okay, so we got square root of u is equal to this. Let's go ahead and uh, substitute our u back in. Where did we define that? Right now. Okay, so we get the square root of minus y plus 2 is equal to x minus c1. And now we can square both sides and we get minus y plus 2 is equal to x minus c1 squared. We can add this, uh, well I guess subtract this 2 over, so we get minus y is equal to x minus c1 squared minus 2, which tells us that y is equal to uh, minus x minus c1 squared plus 2, okay? And uh, that looks pretty similar, actually, doesn't it? Because we look at this, we have this something that looks like a constant that looks just like what this horizontal shift is, okay? And if we expand this out a little bit, so if we look at our original equation, our special case, and we FOIL this out. So let's go ahead and do that real quick. So that tells us that our original thing is minus, so it's y equals minus, uh, we got x squared minus 6x plus 9 plus 2, right, just foiling this out, which is equal to minus x squared 
plus 6x minus 9 plus 2, which is equal to minus x squared oops, plus 6x minus 9. Well, it's going to be minus 7. Okay. Great. So this is, our, this is the same equation as this. And now we have a general solution to our differential equation here. Now, what I was saying earlier, and if you've had a course in differential equations, you already know that if we impose some initial conditions, we can see if this reduces to our special case. So what would that have to be? If this is really our thing, if this is our, our original equation, this is our special case, well, if x is 0, if x is 0, then y should be minus 7, right? So let's see if we impose that initial condition, if we impose that y of 0 is equal to minus 7. Let's see if this holds true if we put that into this. Let's see if there is a c1 value that gives this relationship. So that would tell us that y of 0 is equal to, we got minus 0 minus c1 plus 2 equals uh, minus 7, okay, and this should be squared, uh, okay, so we get it, which is equal to minus, minus c1 squared plus 2 equals minus 7, which is equal to minus c1 squared plus 2 equals minus 7, so minus c1 squared is equal to minus 9, so C1 is equal to 3. So when we substitute C1 equals 3 back into here, we get the exact same special case that we started off with. But not only that, when we have this differential equation, what we find is that this gives us an entire family of solutions for any C value. This, this is the solution. This is the differential equation for a parabola that says the solution to this will correspond to any kind of horizontal shift you could want. So in a sense, it has an infinite number of projectile motion solutions that might have the same height or something like that, but be shifted arbitrarily. And the reason for doing this whole exercise was to show that if you could write something in terms of a differential equation, well then maybe that thing isn't that special after all, and maybe it's just part of something that's much more general, something that's much more fundamental. Now one thing to take away from this so far is we solved a first order differential equation, which means that we got one constant of integration, which we were able to solve for by imposing one initial condition. And first order differential equations because of this are usually less general and more specific than say second order differential equations. And this is pretty easy to see if we say take the second derivative of this. Well the second derivative of this would be minus 2. So it would be y double prime is equal to minus 2. And uh, to save some time let's just you know integrate this twice. Or So this is the same thing as saying d squared y dx squared is equal to minus 2. So that we can integrate this once and we will get that uh, y prime is equal to minus 2 x plus c. Integrate it again, we get that y is equal to minus 2, well actually that one half will come down, so that will be a minus x squared plus cx plus d. And since we have these two things, we have two tunable parameters that we can then use to model something even more general than this. And in nature, most things tend to be described by second order differential equations. And I think the natural next question to ask is why does nature care about second order differential equations? And it's, well, for equations of motion, if you're talking about things like Newton's second law, it requires specifying the behavior of things like its position and velocity. And if you think a little bit harder about that, that's really specifying its position and momentum. Going any higher order would require to know, uh, know information about its acceleration at all times. Not to mention, if you go any higher than second order, the higher order differential equations tend to be less stable. They tend to blow up because they're more sensitive to your initial conditions. And basically what that tells you is that a small change in your initial conditions can lead to wildly different answers. And if that happens, then that equation doesn't really help you very much. And I'm saying that doesn't help you very much because those initial conditions are usually measurements, right? So that's saying if your measurement is just a little bit off, then you get an extremely different answer. And it's like, well, 
Okay. <laughs> and now we're ready to finally tackle some physics implications of this. So some things that we've taken away. We know that second order differential equations are more general than first order differential equations. You need to impose some kind of special caseness in order to get it to like a first order thing. Uh, or you need some initial conditions rather. Um, so let, let's, let's tether this to some physics. Let's start with an equation that everybody knows. Everyone has heard of F equals MA. If you're a physics major and you're a little bit farther along, you might know how to express this as a second order differential equation. First thing to know is that acceleration is the time derivative of velocity, and velocity is the time derivative of position, which tells you that acceleration is the second derivative of position, which says that we can write this equation as F equals M d squared x dt squared. So there we have uh, what are Newton's laws expressed as a second order differential equation. And let's see what we can do with this. So if we integrate both sides with respect to time, so we do the integral of f dt, we just lose one of these dt's here, these uh, differentials here, that's equal to m dx dt. But we haven't really specified any physics yet, really. I mean, we're starting with one of these sort of axioms, but we're not really applying it to describe anything specific, right? We don't know what the nature of this force is. Is it like a conservative force? Is it something that's changing? Um, so we can't really do anything with this right now. But if we impose sort of a special case, we can turn this into a real closed form first order differential equation. Meaning, say for example, F is constant which would mean that F over M is equal to some constant acceleration, assuming the mass isn't changing. Okay, well then we can divide both sides by M, and we get that the integral of A dt from 0 to t, clock starts at 0, is equal to M dx, oops, no, we lost that M because we just divided it over, is equal to dx. Okay, and then that just picks up a factor of t, so we get a t is equal to dx. Okay, and then let's go ahead and integrate this one more time with respect to t and this with respect to x. So we get the integral again, clock starts at 0 to t, a t dt is equal to the integral of dx. And let's have some initial displacement xi to some final xf and we get that at one half at squared is equal to delta x. So if we imply some special case, if we make some initial assumptions about the physics that's going on here, we get that we can arrive at things like the equation for something that's falling freely, that's not subject to any external forces, and relate the time and the acceleration to its displacement. So a big reason why differential equations are so widely used in physics is so that we don't always have to think in terms of special cases. But thank you guys for watching. I know that the beginning of this was super rambly, so I'm sure I'll do something like leave a timestamp so that you'll be able to skip all that if you're super solid with differential equations and just wanted to see the physics part. Let me know in the comment section if you have any questions about this, and I'll see you guys there.